So having discussed the distinction between uh, stock pollutants and flow pollutants, we are now equipped to discuss what is the efficient level of pollution. And uh, this might sound somewhat somewhat weird uh, that uh, that uh, that it it might be tempting to think that uh, that zero level of pollution is always uh, always the desirable goal. But in environmental economics, we we recognize that uh, that there is also some benefits of of polluting. So it's not that the firms and households are are dumping pollution to the natural environment because they are evil or they they want to damage the nature, but rather it is just somehow undesirable side product of their economic activity. And we need to also take into account the benefits of the economic activity when we think about the pollution control targets. So if we think about first uh, focusing on just uh, flow pollution and uh, for a moment we ignore this uh, accumulation of stock. Uh, so the idea here is that we want to maximize the net benefit from the pollution. So we denote by capital M the, the amount of pollution and uh, recognizing that there is some kind of benefit from this pollution. The benefit comes from, of course, from this economic activity. For example, we burn some fossil fuel to generate uh, energy to, to heat our homes or generate electricity. So, so there is certain benefit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, living in a, in a warmed house. So think about this, uh, this, um, this uh, that there is this kind of association between this kind of benefit to the society and the amount of, uh, of pollution M. So, so we can talk about this benefit function B as a function of pollution M. And uh, we assume that there is this kind of increasing but concave uh, relationship between this benefit and the amount of, uh, amount of pollution. So the benefit... Uh, uh, decreases as we increase the the um, volume of uh, economic activity. So if, if you think about this, my example of uh, of burning fossil fuel to warm up house, then uh, then initially, of course, there is a great benefit of uh, adding temperature, but uh, eventually, then uh, then uh, additional degrees of, of of temperature, the marginal benefit is smaller and smaller. So that this is why this benefit function is concave the, the, that uh, that it becomes flatter and flatter so then there is also also uh, another side is damage and we can think about this damage that this is some kind of external damage that uh, that the causer of this of this or or emitter of the pollution doesn't necessarily uh, suffer from this damage uh, himself or herself but it goes to the to the um, to the nature, and in this sense, this damage is is kind of external damage. Uh, so it's externality to the society. So so, and we think that this damage function is also increasing, but it is increasing and convex. So more more there is emission, the the greater the damage becomes. And we talked about now this kind of uh, as an example of flow pollution. Think about, for example, noise. That, that that initially maybe the noise is low level of noise is not really that harmful but when it gets more and more noisy it also start starts to become more annoying and eventually cause also also already health health damage so when we plot this uh, this benefit function and damage function to the same diagram so in this uh, this figure 6.4 taken from the permanent album uh, we have on the horizontal axis the amount of pollution M, and then we have this uh, this uh, value of damage function and benefit function on the on the vertical axis. So think about this benefit function and damage function that somehow we converted in monetary terms. So we have them, for example, in euros. So what is the euro value of of the damage function, and what is the euro value of the benefit function? We will discuss later in the course that how this kind of uh, uh, economic valuation can be done in practice, but just assume now that uh, that this damage function and benefit function are expressed in the same units, for example, euros. So then our idea from the from this kind of uh, social planner's point of view. So if you think about the policymaker who will then set some kind of uh, emission standards, 
then the idea is that uh, we want to maximize the net benefit from the societal point of view. So we want to find uh, the point on this uh, uh, on this uh, horizontal axis where the difference between uh, this function B and function D is as large as possible. And this is indicated with this uh, this uh, arrow in this uh, in this diagram. So there the difference between this uh, difference B minus D is as large as possible. So so this would be then this kind of efficient level of uh, of emission. If you emit more, then then the difference becomes smaller. And eventually, it can become also that the damages outweigh the benefits. And if you do not emit anything, then you also uh, do not get these benefits of the pollution. This is the this is the idea. So then, the next question would be: How do we find if if suppose that we know we have this this benefit function and the damage function? So how would we find this in practice? So this is then then when we when we resort to the microeconomic theory so and and start to differentiate so then we have this notion of marginal benefit and marginal damage and this is when we expand this figure a little bit further so on the on the right hand side of this this figure we have then plotted in the same diagram uh, the marginal benefit curve and the marginal damage curve so these are assumed to be in this case linear. So so as as you as you see that this uh, absolute level of benefit is is uh, decreasing. So it means that marginal benefit. Sorry, so the the growth rate of the benefit function is is uh, is decreasing. So it means that this marginal benefit is decreasing. And in this example, it is plotted as a linear function. And same same for the for the marginal damage function. So this marginal benefit function is just the derivative of, of function B with respect to M, and, and the marginal damage is just the derivative of the, of the function D with respect to M. So if we then find the point where the marginal damage equals marginal benefit, so then we arrive at this point uh, M asteric, where marginal benefit and marginal damage is equal, and at that point also we find that this uh, on this left hand side uh, left hand side diagram it coincides with this point where the the difference between uh, between benefit function and damage function is as as large as possible so this is the principle how we can can uh, find the uh, societal optimal level of uh, of uh, of emission and notice also then in this uh, on the right hand side diagram there this marginal ban benefit and marginal damage are set equal so there is this mu asteric on the on the horizontal axis indicated so this is this mu asteric is actually this equal to the marginal benefit which is also equal to the marginal marginal damage and we can think about this as this kind of some kind of shadow price of the of the emission in this in this optimal level of the of the emission and this is also also some importance when we talk about, for example, then policy instruments a little bit later on. Okay, so this is the situation for the for the for the the how how we can set the efficient level of uh, of flow pollution. Another way of thinking about this then also, if we think about it more from the perspective of uh, pollution abatement. Uh, and this is then taken from the permanent album uh, figure 6.5. So suppose in, initially we would be in this situation M, M hat over here, I indicate with the, with the cursor. So of course, if we have the have, have some kind of polluting firm which uh, doesn't have any kind of um, doesn't face any kind of regulation or pollution control and uh, does not suffer any of this of these damages so it can just externalize all this all this damage cost to 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 other other parties then profit maximizing firm would operate and this point uh, um point m uh, m hat where where the where the marginal marginal benefit goes to zero so it would would continue to emit as long as there is some benefit 
from the from the emission. So now in this diagram, I forgot to mention that these two curves that cross there again this marginal marginal benefit and marginal damage. So another way of thinking about this marginal benefit curve is also that it would be marginal abatement cost because if you if you decrease the emission, if the firm is decreasing the emissions, then there is the opportunity cost because uh, because it needs to uh, either downsize the production level or or invest in in some kind of uh, uh, abatement measures to or some kind of new technology or or cleaner fuels or something. So so therefore this marginal benefit curve we can also think about it as marginal abatement cost curve. So now if we for example think about that the government uh, imposes some kind of regulation that forces the or, or incentivizes the firm to to decrease the emissions from the level M hat to this M asteric which was the which was the societally optimal level of emissions. So therefore in this diagram this uh, a dark shaded area indicated as uh, C1. This would then, this size of the area is, is the, can be interpreted as the abatement cost for the firm. So then firm has this kind of, uh, firm needs to decrease the emissions and therefore it uh, it is then uh, foregoing some some of these benefits from the, that it would originally get and this uh, level M hat of the emissions. So this would be then this kind of uh, loss for the for the uh, emitting firm. However, of course, the the society would also also benefit in terms of the smaller amount of damages. So this is not indicated in this uh, in this figure, but of course, the, if if you if you would draw a vertical line from this uh, M hat all the way to this damage curve, so this huge white area over here, this is of course then then uh, also avoided this these damages are avoided so so this is why it is beneficial to decrease the emission because uh, because the society will decrease this uh, this damage cost and uh, perhaps one way to incentivize the firm to to decrease the emissions could be could be to uh, subsidize this abatement so that's one one possibility if we don't want to uh, hurt the interest of the of the firm it would be also possible to to uh, compensate the firm for this this abatement activity so then think about this uh, this situation that what if we have even more stringent uh, uh, emission standard and and continued all the way to this m uh, subscript a point so think about this MA as some kind of alternative uh, uh, alternative target where we put even more stringent uh, uh, pollution control target. Would this be even even better solution for the for the societal point of view? And now actually we can we can utilize this kind of uh, welfare analysis. And this is this kind of graphical. Uh, we have you have perhaps in the in the um, uh, microeconomics courses. Uh, uh, observe this kind of notion of uh, notion of uh, uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus. So, in the similar way, uh, we can think about also this uh, this uh, this kind of uh, how much this kind of uh, uh, welfare of the society is affected if we further further move from this M asteric to M A. So, notice now that uh, that if we if we do that kind of move. Then there, there is a additional decrease of, of damage cost, uh, which is this area indicated by C2. And it, it's uh, restricted by this broken line on the left and this M, M asteric on top. So this area is this uh, decrease in the, in the damages, this external damages decreased by this, this amount. However, there is also, also then decrease in the, in the, decrease in the benefits to from the from the pollutant or in some sense the abatement costs increase so the abatement cost uh, would then be the sum of this uh, c2 and c3 so it would be all the way here so this is why from the societal point of view then then the abatement cost would increase would be higher than this uh, this decrease in the damage costs 
if we go all the way to this uh, this stringent level. So, so therefore, from the from the societal welfare point of view, this MA is too stringent. So, so the so the abatement cost is too high compared to the to the additional uh, decrease in damages. So, from this kind of graphical analysis, we can see that uh, this M asteric is maximizing the the uh, societal uh, benefit. So in some sense, what we want to we want to maximize, perhaps this uh, this title of the figure is somewhat misleading. So it's kind of highlighting that we want to minimize the sum of abatement cost and sum of damage cost. So the sum of abatement cost is here is this uh, C one, and sum of damage cost uh, damage cost is this uh, C two. But in some sense, what we want to actually maximize is this area between the below this marginal abatement cost curve and above the marginal damage, damage cost curve. And, uh, and from this graphical point of view, this M asteric is then, then maximizing that, uh, that area. <coughs> so now I want to, want to highlight that so far we have considered the flow pollution. And re remember that flow pollution is just um, this kind of instantaneous damage, uh, like for example, noise pollution or light pollution. Um, some kind of local air pollutants are, are, can be modeled as, as flow pollution. Now, what changes if we, if we then have this kind of uh, stock pollution? And I want to highlight it with this, this next diagram. So actually, in the, in the permanent owl book, it is discussed in more detail, but uh, but similar kind of reasoning can be also applied to the in the case of the of the stock pollutants. We can still look at the um, marginal damages and marginal benefits, but now we also need to take into account this uh, accumulation of uh, of the stock pollutant, and and also then what becomes important is in the we we need to also consider the dynamics. But if we want to want to make it uh, a, a bit more simpler, we can we can consider the so-called steady state. So suppose that uh, there is this kind of um, uh, constant uh, stream of uh, emission to the to the nature, and then there is also some constant rate of decay. So once this uh, this emission is accumulating in the in the um, in the uh, in the environment, then it also decays over time at rate alpha. So here in this uh, in this slide, uh, uh, this Greek alpha indicates uh, what is the decay rate, how quickly this uh, pollutant uh, that has accumulated in the environment, how quickly it decays. So the larger the alpha, then then uh, then uh, the more faster the decay. Okay, so we can talk about perfectly persistent pollutant in the case that this alpha is zero, so that there's no no decay whatsoever so it would be permanently in the in the once it is uh, uh, put to the to the to the environment this pollutant will persist forever and doesn't decay at all but uh, uh, even if you think about something like like uh, radioactive materials the, the, it decays very slowly but but typically most pollutants decay so so more meaningful is perhaps this kind of uh, imperfectly persistent pollutant case in in uh, in reality even if this alpha is very very small it is typically greater than zero so then another parameter that we need to think about is this discount rate r and you can think about this r similar to the for example interest rate so very often in economic theory interest rate is uh, indicated uh, by r uh, but uh, but uh, then in environmental economics, there's a lot of discussion that should be should we think about this discount rate as just as the interest rate, or should it, should we somehow um, adjust this kind of uh, like like for the for the interest of the future generations? The main point is here that R indicates that uh, how much we discount uh, the the future future benefits. 
And uh, there is also possible to set R into zero, which means that we do not discount at all. So notice that if alpha is, is positive and R is equal to zero, so then of course, this, uh, this rule that we have here, so that the marginal damage equals marginal benefit multiplied by one plus R divided by alpha. So if R is zero and alpha is positive, so then this expression in parentheses is equal to one and we are back to this kind of flow pollutant situation. Okay, so if you do not discount anything in the steady state, then actually this stop pollutant case is, is uh, uh, exactly identical to the, to the uh, flow pollutant case. So how this kind of uh, steady state of the stop pollution then, then differs from the flow pollution case it only matters that uh, that uh, that the do we uh, what is our discount rate? Is it greater than zero? And uh, and what is the discount rate in particular relative to the to the um, decay rate alpha? So in that sense, then then this uh, figure six point nine illustrates that uh, that it can make a, make a difference if we have this kind of sort of benefit curve. And, and marginal benefit curve is shifting to the left and rotating. So it's not, not like uh, equal proportional shift, but it's kind of rotating with this, uh, this, uh, this uh, when we take the discount factor R and this DK rate alpha into account, and that can then influence this optimal or efficient level of, um, efficient level of, of pollutant. And interestingly, uh, because both R and alpha, they cannot be negative. So, so if this um, stock pollutant uh, factor influences, uh, it will be so that this uh, efficient level is uh, efficient level of pollutant is somewhat higher than in the in the case of the flow pollutant. That may may seem somewhat counterintuitive because uh, because anyway, this uh, this uh, stock of pollution is uh, is uh, accumulating over time and affecting multiple periods but if we consider this kind of steady state uh, equilibrium uh, with a constant flow of pollutant uh, then it is particularly this discounting that uh, that uh, that makes this uh, uh, makes this kind of uh, increase in the in the societally optimal level of pollutant so because we will then uh, give smaller weight to this future future damages if you give equal weight or, 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 or zero discounting, then then the situation is more or less similar to the to the to the flow pollution. Although in some sense it's exactly similar to the to the situation with the flow pollution. So I do not go to the more technical details of the of the stock pollution. A main point here to emphasize is this uh, idea that uh, that we can utilize this kind of tools of of microeconomics to analyze. What is the societally optimal level of, of pollution? And typically the, the optimal level is not zero. And typically also it is not this kind of uh, point where, where the marginal benefit goes to zero. So we should be cautious about, about this kind of situation where the um, emissions continue until uh, marginal benefit goes to zero. But also we should be cautious about uh, too stringent uh, pollution control targets because they can be uh, extremely costly from the from the societal point of view. So this completes my my lesson on the pollution control targets, how how to how to set them based on economic theory. And the third lesson on this topic, I will discuss briefly what is the economist's role in, in setting these uh, emission targets. See you then.